Welcome to the Business Infrastructure Podcast AI Conference. Over the next 12 episodes, you'll hear a combination of fireside chats, keynote speeches, and product demonstrations all centered around AI. Hi there, it's so good to see you. I'm Alicia Butler-Pierre. I am the founder of Equilibria Incorporated, but I also produce the Business Infrastructure Podcast, and it's all about helping other small business owners as well as entrepreneurs figure out how to better operate so that you can grow and scale to the next level. We share all kinds of tips and resources here on this podcast. So we're doing something a little bit different this particular season. We are actually attempting to do a virtual tech conference that focuses specifically on AI, artificial intelligence. We've all been hearing about it, right? It's all the rage right now, even though it's a technology that's been out for a very long time. But we're going to take a deep dive into it, talking about not only what it is, but how you can specifically use it to better streamline the way you're doing things in your own business, things that you can start doing quicker, better, faster, cheaper. And we'll start off with this first video that will tell you very specifically about what AI is and all that it it can, can do for you. After that, the subsequent videos that we'll have for these different interviews will also include actual product demonstrations. So go ahead and subscribe right now, pause, subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss any of these videos. I promise you it is content worth watching because it will dramatically improve the way that you're operating your business. And then press play again and we'll get right into it. Thank you so much and I hope you enjoy this episode. To kick things off is our quote unquote opening speaker that I'll be having a fireside chat with, none other than Shell Carlson. He is currently in the Boston area, is that correct? The greater Boston area, okay. And he's going to give us a primer, if you will, on artificial intelligence. We're going to do our best to not go all over the place because AI is such a big topic. We will try our best to keep the scope as narrow and as focused as possible. Uh, but Shell is going to, again, tell us what AI is at a most at its most basic foundational level, how we can use it, and why now, and so much more. So let's get right into it, Shell. I noticed when I visited your LinkedIn profile that you describe yourself as an AI strategist and evangelist. What exactly does that mean according to you? Well, I I have the incredible good fortune, both in in the roles that I've been doing for a couple of years now, to be in that role of advising folks on how they can leverage these nebulous, often untested, often unclear technologies to drive business impact. So in my current role, head of data science strategy at Domino, I do this with large companies in the pharmaceuticals, insurance, and healthcare realm. A lot of folks who have sometimes hundreds, if not thousands of data scientists and are doing incredible things. Uh, but prior to that, I was a uh, industry analyst at Forrester, where I got to cover the, the full breadth of the AI data science, machine learning, computer vision space. Uh, so it's one where I get to be part uh, part advisor and consultant to help folks. Okay, well, this is how you can, these are use cases that you can go after for maximum success. This is how you can think about scaling your teams and uh, providing them with the technologies that they need access to. So some of it's that. Some of it is that evangelist. It is the, there are so many incredible things that we can and should be doing with these technologies and that we should have been doing for a really long time now for, for a lot of them. And so I get to stand on a soapbox there, but I also get to be a a therapist. There are just so many folks who struggle with uh, with these technologies. It's the, you know, they're, they're data science teams where the organization doesn't understand them. They are being asked to do the impossible. They don't have the resources that they need. And it's often helping guide them through it, realize that they're not alone in this uh, in this challenge and, and help them uh, see the light at the end of the tunnel and, and get there a little bit faster. And that's why I think you are the perfect person for us to kick off this particular season. Now, I, I do find your background to be incredibly interesting because I noticed your educational background is in economics. Not only do you have, you have an undergraduate degree, I believe from Columbia, but then you have a master's degree as well as a PhD from Harvard. 
in economics. So how did you go from studying economics, Shell, to eventually becoming a data scientist and now this AI evangelist? Well, an interesting story in all of this was how I became an economist, which was I was two courses away from a degree in computer science, and I came to a course titled Artificial Intelligence. Uh, this was in the late 90s. I looked at the syllabus, and the syllabus said, neural networks and heuristics. And I thought, nobody's going to be using those anytime soon. They've been around for ages, and they haven't gotten anywhere. Versus those economists over there are leveraging applied statistics and machine learning in order to pull really interesting insights from data. I can go in and do practical stuff with machine learning as an economist in a way that I'm not getting to do as a computer scientist. So the, the irony is entirely on me that I'm this person who went and dropped these courses way back when. And pretty much everything that I've done since about 2014, 2015 onwards has solely been within the, within the AI space. But the, the big change happened um, around 2013, 2014, when I was put in charge of a data science team. And I had incredible data scientists underneath me who came up with these incredible ideas, amongst other ones, were leveraging machine learning technologies to go in and understand uh, what people were saying and to try and, and, try and uh, help them learn faster. So we were building AI applications that um, our um, BDRs and SDRs uh, would be using to, to try and learn how to sell the product. So we would ask them, okay, you just watch a training video on the product. You know, tell me about, tell me about the product in your own words. And we would go in and uh, transcribe that audio, listen to it, identify what it was that they were talking about and saying, well, you know, you missed these key value propositions. Uh, why don't you try it again? And so we started building those around that time. I eventually got poached uh, and became an industry analyst uh, covering the AI space. And obviously, it's it has just taken uh, taken off since uh, since then. Um, again, I, I I keep on pinching myself that I have the the good fortune to have this role. Um, but it does also drive home that you know you don't have to go back that many years, and the the role of a data scientist didn't exist. So speaking of speaking of that, data scientist. Does AI go hand in hand with data science? And, and as you answer that question, Shell, what exactly is artificial intelligence? Because I've been hearing you mention machine learning. Is machine learning a branch of AI or is it the other way around? Or is yeah. it along a spectrum, if you will? Well, that is one of the key things when it comes to artificial intelligence is getting our terminology right. Yes, because you'll, you'll walk into a you'll walk into a room and people will be have all of these different opinions around artificial intelligence, and they usually be right. They were just talking about different elements, different parts of the spectrum. So the folks who are com complete detractors are absolutely right, but around certain particular aspects of it, and the folks who are gung ho enthusiasts are usually absolutely right, but around particular elements of it, and they never really overcome that con that. Uh, that uh, that lack of common vocabulary, uh, but yeah, artificial intelligence. Uh, if you back in the days, it used to refer to a whole host of different technologies. And applied statistics was in there, business rules engines were in there. But these days, when you say artificial intelligence, really, folks are referring to a very specific branch of machine learning, and those are called artificial neural networks. Um, and so these, these artificial neurons are mathematical representations of the biological neurons in our brains. You know, they take a couple of inputs, they process them, they, it, they pass it on. And when you create um, millions, sometimes billions of these artificial neurons, usually millions, um, they can do incredible things in terms of detecting patterns in data and being able to replicate a lot of very human-like behaviors. So... These days, when folks are saying artificial intelligence, they're really meaning artificial neural networks, which is the same thing as another term called deep learning. Deep learning is just these artificial neural networks, but that they're they're stacked in in, a, in lots and lots of layers. Hence, the it's deep. Um, but what's happening right now is is something called generative AI. And generative AI, you might have heard the term large language models. You might have heard the term foundation models. All referring to the same thing. It's a particular type of uh, artificial neural network or a particular type of deep learning, if you so will, uh, which are again, all different types of machine learning. Um, and these are incredibly powerful. Uh, these are the things that if you've been playing around with ChatGPT or you've heard of ChatGPT, this, these are the, uh, the kinds of models that are making that possible. So 
I know when you and I spoke outside of this particular interview, we were we were, you know, kind of chuckling over the fact that this technology has been around for a while. So it begs the question, why now? Because the first time I can recall hearing about Chat GPT Shell was maybe November of last year. So that would have been what, November 2022? Yep. November 2022 was exactly when Chat GPT was launched. Okay. And, you know, and I'm, I'm reading all of these articles about it and I signed up for an account. And once I was able to actually get in and, you know, it's like, okay, this is cool, but but if it's all if it's always been around, and I, I remember you telling me in particular that the date, you know, as data scientists, you all have already always known the potential. But why now? Why all of the hype? It's almost as though a light switch was flipped, and all of a sudden, every tool I, I can think of almost every tool that my team and I use in, in terms of a digital technology tool, Slack, Grammarly, um, Canva, canva canva.com, all of these tools, they all now have this notion, monday.com, they all have this AI component now. What happened is, did some some data scientists in a lab get together and they were tinkering behind and then all of a sudden said, okay, we're releasing this to the, the world, go play with this and figure out how you can add some type of an AI component or layer it onto the technology that you already have in place. Can you please explain why all of the hype now? Well, it is to a certain extent what you're describing. There was a very specific invention in 2017. So that, I mean, deep learning has been around for a long time. Artificial neural networks have been around forever. I mean, they think they were first proposed in the 1940s. But what happened in 20 in uh, in 2017 was the the creation of something called the the transformer network. Um, it's um, it's an almost it's sort of based off of humans. When when you think of a word, the meaning of that word depends not just on the the, the words that I've just said prior to the word. It actually will change depending on what I then say next. So the meaning of what I'm saying varies depending on um, uh, looking just slightly forward and slightly backwards in terms of a series, uh, in terms of data, in terms of language or, or something like that. So in 2017, folks came up with this idea and said, hey, wait a minute, uh, why don't we try this and see whether or not our models work work better? And it uh, it really transformed everything. It made it possible now to gen to um, be able to analyze unstructured data like language, voice, um, images, and video in a way that we've never really been able to to do before. So there was this sort of this spark, this aha moment. You know, think back to two thousand one, a space odyssey, when the you know the apes are <laughs> are, are 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 learning how to use tools. Uh, we had those tools, but this one development uh, really made it possible now for these models to behave in much, much more human-like behaviors in a way that, well, we had we had made some headway already. We had start, computer vision was already uh, was already going like gangbusters. Facial recognition was taking off, but we didn't have this. Um, we hadn't really cracked the nut around language uh, and around uh, around images, um, and so that happened in 2017. But then you can ask, well, but that was know, five six years ago. What on earth happened? Why why did it take so long? Well, in, in the back rooms amongst data scientists, folks were playing with these and thinking, these things do incredible things, but they were the only ones who heard about it. They, 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 they mentioned it upwards and people were like, yeah, well, whatever, that sounds, that sounds like a science project. Uh, let's go and focus on creating those you know, lead scoring models and other things that are actually going to drive us business soon. What happened then was, as you're saying, November 2022. Uh, when ChatGPT came along and created a killer application around this. It created an experience that anybody could go in and use and, and say, oh my goodness, this thing can do incredible things. I want to go and uh, <laughs> go in and um, write a, a resume for myself. Voila, I, it, can, it, it, will, it will create a resume for it. I want to create a better version of my existing resume. Voila, it will do that. I want to go in and create a performance evaluation uh, for, my, for myself to, to give to my manager. Voila, it will come up with one of those. Um, I want to go in and write code um, without necessarily knowing what, what, the, what the syntax is and, and things like that. And voila, it's giving, me, it's giving me code that I can then go in and execute or, or, uh, or run a, an analytics query with. 
Uh, so that brought home to everybody, whether it be, you know, your children, uh, grandparents, uh, certainly everybody within the business that, oh my goodness, this is, this is real. Um, uh, and this is very human-like in terms of what it, of what it can do. Um, and so that has then been the aha moment. There's a little bit of a repeat of 2012, you know, when Siri and Alexa came around and for a little bit, uh, uh, execs were like, oh, look, but AI must be real now because my Alexa device can speak to me. But that, uh, that faded very quickly because really we were very limited in terms of what capabilities it had there. Now, uh, really, the, it's it's almost like if you've cracked open Pandora's box or uh, the sky's the limit, depending on how you uh, how you view it, <laughs> in terms of the kinds of use cases we can apply this technology to. Well, speaking of of use cases, I remember when I first signed up for my free Chat GPT account many, many, many months ago. I just remember thinking, "Oh, this is really cool." And and I didn't think beyond that. And then I started reading again other articles about different ways that people were using it, the way students were using it to write <laughs> essays, solve math problems, write code. But it obviously has so many more meaningful applications. And, and this is the direction that I'd like to now take our conversation in, Shell. When it comes to generative AI, and I do want you to explain what that means compared to some of the other forms of AI. What is it that, or how can we generically, as small business owners, actually leverage a tool like a generative AI technology to actually run our businesses more efficiently? Before we get into that question, can you first explain what generative AI is? Because ChatGPT is the one that so many of us know about. And so it is a generative AI technology. What exactly does that mean? So as we were talking about before, there were these artificial neural networks. And for the most part, they're really good at understanding unstructured data. But it's mostly on the understanding of it. So it will... Uh, look at a, uh, um, um, you can feed it a set of emails and it will understand, okay, well, out of these emails, which of these are customers who are really unhappy with the product? What are they unhappy about? Um, or it'll be like, which of these ones have an intent to purchase uh, purchase my product? Or which ones of these are, are going to go and give me a very bad net promoter score or things like that? M so most of the way that we've used these technologies in the past has been in the analysis or in the prediction. What is this person going to do? What is What are the characteristics of this person? Now, what generative AI is, is you, you can take that then same model and flip it on its head and say, now, I would like you now, instead of just going and telling me whether this, uh, this per in this email this person was unhappy, I want you to create that email, but one in which this person is uh, now myself and I am looking to go in and have a meeting with somebody. I'm looking to try and persuade somebody that they should take a particular accent, uh, action. So generative AI is the, is the, is the converse, is, is creating with these models. Um, whether that be creating images, like uh, you can do with a, a host of services out there. The most well-known one is Midjourney. So I can go in and, and prompt it to say, um, give, me a, give me an image that represents artificial intelligence regulation, or give me an image of a generative AI model creating um, uh, an application. Oh, and by the way, if you could do this in the style of Picasso. Um, <clears throat> so... It's this these the the architecture behind these models is is similar, um, but it is requires much, much larger models, much more data, they're much more computationally intensive. And they can still do those things that that went before. So the these models are generative AI models, but you can use them for prediction and analysis as well. It's just that before, Everything that we had that we were trying to use for generative use cases was really, really crappy. I mean, it just did not do a good job of it. It was not an, not plausibly at all human sounding versus now um, these models, you, you go in and put them in front of the Turing test, which is, you know, can a person tell whether or not this is a model or a human? And, you know, increasingly we can't uh, because they are so good at, at, at imitating us, which is amongst other things, the reason why uh, it's such a challenge in education because 
it's really, really difficult right. to, to tell whether one of these things is, is fake or not, uh, because you know you can you can tell a model to go in and in include the kind of flaws that you would make as a high school student. Oh wow! <laughs> now, just I just want to make sure that I I understand the difference bet between predictive versus generative AI. So, predictive AI is that something comparable to? For example, if I were to go onto Amazon and purchase one of the books that you have there behind you, and then Amazon may then say, oh, Alicia, if you liked this book, you may also like these books as well. Or customers who bought this same book as you also bought these books as well. Is that a form of predictive AI or no? Exactly. Um, but that kind, that structure of that problem uh, applies to just so many decisions that we have in um, uh, in 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 life. So um, if I, for example, wanted to comb through all of the emails that have come into my organization and find out, well, which one of these customers is most unhappy and is most likely to leave my company. Um, that is actually a prediction problem. It just we might think not think of it as prediction, but we are predicting uh, the degree to which the this email uh, corresponds to that that kind of a problem. Or similarly, like which one of these customers is is most unhappy uh, or for that matter, most happy? That's actually a prediction uh, problem. But it is, uh, as we were talking about before, it's more of an analytic exercise. It's trying to understand all of this incoming data that's coming in. What we have the opportunity to do with generative AI is to flip that on its head and now go in and do it the opposite way, which is I want to now create that content. I would like to create those emails. I would like to create that code. I would like to create those queries, those visualizations, those presentations, um, all of those things. I would like to to create using uh, using these models that you know previously I couldn't do. Uh, so, it when it comes to I think one of the things that you're asking so is well so what should we use these things for? Should we be going in and looking to replace people with these uh, because now it can do these human like uh, human like activities? And for the most part, the answer to that is usually no. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have seen very few instances where anybody has lost their job off of this. Um, is it the case that maybe you need a lot fewer people? Um, possibly, but for the most part, this is giving humans superpowers. It is going in and uh, doing that the, the the manual effort, the things that don't require that much in the way of human intelligence, and uh, giving us the head start. So I often like to think of like Clay Christensen had his jobs to be done framework, and you know, think of what you're you're offering as if it was being hired to do a job. What would that job mm. be? And for for generative AI, I've I've found about five different job core jobs, and the first one is the first draft generator, uh, creating that first draft of the email, creating that first draft of an investor presentation, creating a first draft of a of a of a, a conceptual uh, graphic, uh, or creating the first draft of that uh, of off of code, or creating that first draft of that uh, of that of that graph or chart that you want to display. Uh, generative AI is, is really good at getting you to that first draft, sometimes even second or third draft. Um, but then you, the human expert takes over and goes in and 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 tailors it, improves it, uh, does the sense check on it, make sure that it's factually accurate because these models do hallucinate, uh, which is they they will invent facts because that's what they that's what they're doing. They're inventing things much in the same way that humans do, by the way. Uh, so uh, a core role is in this um, in this first draft generator. A, a second one would be information summarizer because these technologies are really good at going in and looking across reports, documents, uh, structured and unstructured data, and going in and point and making sense of it, helping me find. So uh, I'm really interested in this subset of customers because I want to develop this new product. So which of my customers? is um, most likely using this our product in this particular way. Uh, and then we can comb across all of uh, the information that, that that's out there. Or which, um, which uh, companies that are out there in their financial reports are most interested in this particular topic that my, my, my business is going after? 
uh, again, these technologies are really good at combing through all of this, all of these documents, reports, online information, and going in and synthesizing not just which reports have that information, which parts of those, but even drawing trends across them. Like what are what are the main things that are most important to businesses today is something that you can absolutely feed into a into one of these generative models with varying degrees of success. And, uh, and you also want to give it a lot more information in order to make sure that you get something back. But that's that's another story there. Um, so that that information summarizer aspect is a, a yet another core uh, core job. Uh, other ones are things like um, uh, customer customer listener going in and listening to your customers as well as actually employees and finding out. So what are they talking about? What are what are they frustrated with? What are they what do they want the most, um, uh, etc. And then there are two other ones. One of them is like an application enhancer, as you've already discovered. Pretty much every every business application under the sun is feeding in generative AI um, uh, uh, capabilities, usually in the form of some like virtual assistant uh, that's relying on generative AI to do that. And um, last but not least, these models are actually really good at generating uh, generating data. So uh, whether that be because you want to uh, protect sensitive data, so you want to kind of hide it and obscure it, or whether or not you want to help uh, clean the data in your database by going in and, and filling in, uh, sanitizing, structuring your data more correctly. These technologies work pretty well for that, but that's more, more again, we're in, back in the realm of the, the data science use cases of it versus the, the business user use cases. This was great sharing these five use cases with us. And as I, as I, as I'm looking at the first four, first draft generator, information summarizer, customer slash employee listener, and application enhancer. It seems to me, Shell, that you you have to have a source of data to begin with, that it, it isn't just, and, and maybe this is my misunderstanding of how this generative AI actually works, but it seems as though, for example, with ChatGPT, it is scouring the World Wide Web. It is scouring all of these online resources that are already out there and literally within seconds synthesizing that data and providing an answer to, or, or it is responding to whatever query you as the user enter. So yeah. with, okay, is that how it works? That That's it, how it works, um, okay. but there's a key difference. And okay. that's that... Um, whereas previously, you pretty much needed to own all of that data to begin with in order to really get started. So you needed these huge corpuses of data that somebody had gone in and uh, and annotated so that uh, the patterns that you were looking for were marked in that data. What's happened now is that those models are then being made available to folks and that you can take that model and then do fine tuning on it. So whereas um, that, that that large language model that's out there, there are open source ones like Falcon um, uh, is probably is the best known. Meta has its Llama two uh, that's out there. There are there's an ecosystem of open sourced generative AI models that are out there. Um, you can make them even more accurate by then doing additional fine tuning on them with your own data or with industry specific data um, to make it even more accurate. So what's happened is that you can sort of build on the shoulders of giants, as you will, um, and take these models, which have already been trained on incredible amounts of data, and then go and provide additional fine tuning on them. And sometimes they it, it spans domains in ways that you would have completely not predicted. So right now, most of the pharmaceutical firms that I'm speaking with, for example, are taking these models, which are trained and understand human language, and then they're doing fine tuning on molecular data. And all of a sudden, kind of black magically, you now have models that can go in and propose synthetic proteins that you would use for treating things like diabetes and heart disease off of them. Wow. It's not easy by any stretch of the imagination, but there's something about the, the commonality in the, in the type of data that we're looking for and the type of problems that we're going after that mean that you can take these, these so-called foundation models and then go and apply them in all apply them in in all of these different domains in ways that we never really thought thought possible. So you can do fine tuning on them. The other thing that you can do is you can feed it a lot of context beforehand. So I can go in and when I when the query comes in, I go in, uh, and say, well, uh, this is what the person asked. 
but I know that they're in finance. Uh, I know that they're really interested in about in applying for a mortgage. Uh, I I want to I want you to give them this inf- uh, this information or take into account this information. Uh, so use all of that when you then um, uh, when you're then processing this answer and craft a much more tailored answer. So in these cases, unlike the first one where you're taking the model and you're building on the model. Here, you're just using that very generic general purpose model. It's just you're giving it a lot more context and a lot more information to help it customize its the its output for the, the specific use case that you're, you want to go for. And that aspect of it is, is also new. So you're building on the shoulders of giants, and you're able to reuse this, this, this multifaceted tool by going in and, um, I don't know, it's a little bit like putting the Lego around that tool in order to make it into a different, the, the specialized tool that you would like. I need to work okay. on that analogy. So speaking of standing on the shoulders of giants, I, I'd like to, uh, if we if we can, attempt to use a fairly generic example, but something that relates to everyone who's in business because we're all in business, number one, to make money, but we, we all thrive off of having customers or clients, right? Something we can all relate to. So to that extent, Shell, let's, let's look at a CRM, a customer relationship management application, speaking of a giant like Salesforce, for example. So if there is a company that is using Salesforce to house all of their customer data or a good bit of their customer data, I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. Is it possible to have an AI application built on that would combine data from Salesforce, the customer data that you have in a tool like Salesforce, plus, let's say, online reviews from things like uh, Google and, and Yelp and some of the other trust pilots, some of the other review sources that are out there, as well as email. So if you use Microsoft Outlook, for example, or whatever email application you're using, are you suggesting that an AI application could could literally bring all of that customer data together to give you as a business owner potential insights into this is what your customers like about certain products and services, this is what they don't like, and this is what can help drive you toward maybe new innovations and certain, you know, creating new product lines, new service offerings, whatever the case may be. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes. Uh, Is that uh, how it works? You're, okay. you are, you're, you're spot on. Um, when it comes to things like Salesforce, you can think of all of that data that's trapped in those freeform notes that are there, or you can think of all of those emails that are attached to customer interactions. Um, depending on who you're leveraging, um, you might also even have transcripts of uh, of calls that are in there, of from outbound sales calls or from uh, from uh, from that are coming in customer service calls. All of that information is there and usually completely ignored uh, because mm. I, either you're usually forced to read through all of it. The notes were badly written; they're all inconsistent. And what generative AI enables you to do is to go in and leverage the AI to do that hard work of reading through all of those and extracting out those those insights and drawing those trends and finding the, the, that that those needles in the, uh, in the in the haystack for you if you if you so will. Um, and so, in terms of consuming these, uh, like Salesforce, for example, has um, I think it's GPT for Einstein or Einstein GPT. They have their own um, large language model that 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 they're making available, and you can use that to, to design a a still very fairly basic um, uh, generative AI application in Salesforce as a Salesforce developer to do. It's still early days in terms of what Salesforce is making available, but it's also tends to be then limited to the Salesforce ecosystem or anything that you can get in Salesforce. And it tends to go after the, the low hanging, the, the most or the, the lowest common denominator, if you will, in terms of what folks folks will need. Salesforce, much though I love those guys, are usually so conservative in terms of actually <laughs> launching these ones. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so that 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 is often a frustration there. And so the what about those other use cases that you're describing? What about all of those emails that aren't in Salesforce? What about those reviews that are on Amazon, that are on Walmart.com, Target.com? What about all those social media posts that are that are out there? Um, mm-hmm. What about those images and, and things on, on Instagram? I would love to be able to analyze those as well. 
And the, so the, the incredible thing about this technology is that it does enable you now, it does open up all of those channels for analysis and makes it scalable and easier uh, like, like never before. The problem is, is that it's not necessarily easy. Um, the, the applications, people haven't built enough of that for you, or if they have built it right now, they're, they're charging you a lot of money for it, and they might not be leveraging actually the latest technologies for it. Um, so right now, you're, you're, you're still a little bit limited in terms of, well, do I have to go hire a data scientist? Do I have to go in and uh, do the hard work of building one of those applications myself? And often you are, um, mm -hmm. but that's sort of just a matter of time. Well, the, the really exciting development uh, going forward is that if you, if you take one of these models, they're a little bit like a brain in a vat, right? They can, they can analyze and they can generate, but they can't really take actions uh, today. Right? So they can't go in and say, um, say you wanted to go in and, and um, uh, uh, create a, a new item in Salesforce off of a conversation that you, that you had. Uh, say you wanted to um, uh, go in and um, uh, search a couple of different, um, those investor reports that are out there. Download those 10Ks from all the industries, uh, from all of the companies that are in uh, this financial services industry that are based out of the, uh, out of Massachusetts. Um, and uh, go and find for me the ones that are most interested in generative AI and draft an email, uh, find the executives that, uh, the key executives that would be most related to AI and draft me a template email uh, for me to go and send and reach out to them. And maybe if you can find their email addresses as well, that would, that, that would be great. Where people are creating these combinations of generative AI and rules engines that um, enable you to do that. It still is early days. There are things out there like Auto GPT that that do this, where the uh, the the model itself will propose a set of actions. You know, I, yeah, uh, I I want you to go in and create a business proposal. Well, the model says, well, these are the things that are usually in a business proposal. Uh, let me go in. I think I should uh, scour your website and go in and figure out what the most important things are in that. And then next step would be to go in and create that that presentation for you. Um, does that sound like a good idea? And right now, where we uh, they don't always work the way that you want to. They specific, especially don't work the way that you necessarily want to if you let it go and do its own thing without requiring it to go in and and, and get your feedback on it. But that's the that's the state of the art. It's, it's one of those things where, you know, this wasn't feasible three months ago. For all we know, by the same time next year, you might have those kinds of virtual assistants that enable you to do those things, things that you would normally have required your own assistant to go in and and or certainly would have required a lot of research and, and hard work on your part. And now it's more of a question of being able to take that problem, figure out what the problem was, break it down, um, go in and provide that ongoing guidance to one of these one of these models, um, and then figure out okay, well, how am I going to improve on what it what it get, uh, came back? And we're going to get to that world extremely quickly, uh, which is I think great news for small business owners because small business owners we don't yes. have the I mean we no no one has the luxury of right of of, of people uh, just hanging around who can go in and and do that legwork for you. You only have the 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 experts. Who, uh, who then have to do everything themselves. And so um, right now it's it's a it's a little bit more limited to, well, I can consume these uh, these generative AI models within my existing business applications mm -hmm. and they're so so. Um, I can go in and leverage those models my, myself. I can go in and use Bard or um, ChatGPT or GPT uh, uh, 3.5 or 4. Um, uh, and I can use those to create this uh, content that I that I want to use, whether that be the, my email campaign or um, a proposed marketing campaign or uh, my next business graph uh, logo or graphic. I can use those myself today, and absolutely everybody should. It is it is much easier to use than the. I wouldn't say it's it's not foolproof. It's not 
it's something that that anybody can learn within uh, within a couple of hours. So using those yourself, absolutely. But what's really exciting is what's is what's coming down as it's still always the always the case. Right. <laughs> uh, what's coming down the um, coming down the the pike. But it's uh, you don't have to wait very long. With uh, it's one of it is again we something uh, we we figured out something core. And now that innovation is happening in in weeks. Uh, what that you know was was taking years or decades before. Continuous innovation. Now you said a word that really stood out for me, and that is that it's not foolproof. So let's pivot a little bit and talk about that. Can we trust the results? In short, you have to be very, very careful. Um, you can sort of imagine this when when you're talking to a small child. The perception of what's real and what's not real, and what things that they've made up, is uh, is always an omni omnipresent worry, and that is absolutely the case, especially with the generative AI models that that we have access to today. They will quote unquote hallucinate, which is they will make up facts, they will make up people. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so whatever it's creating, you do need to go and 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 check with uh, with a with a fine tooth comb to make sure that it's 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 actually accurate. Um, uh, it's a it comes with the territory when you're in this creative realm. Uh, it's it is creating these things for you. It doesn't distinguish between whether it's creating a fact or whether it's creating uh, a description uh, for you. And. Uh, so there are there are ways in which this is being addressed, and again, in that in the spirit of that innovation, uh, Bard from Google just recently went in and did things like um, it'll highlight in it uh, particular things, um, and it will go and do a separate set of Google searches to see whether these are backed up by Google searches. Mm -hmm. So it can speed up that process of fact checking um, uh, the, the the things that it's coming up with. So so that's a a big a big thing to to be on the lookout for. The other thing is to be very, very careful about any sensitive data that you are providing to these models, uh, because especially the free versions that are out there, they are often a very explicitly collecting the data that you feed it uh, to use as training for the next versions of those models. So, you know, if you go in and say that you want to you want to write this email to this particular person who is of this particular age, gender, ethnicity, uh, lives in this particular place, voila, you've just given away, you've just sent potentially off something to that is that is PII data. Um, and uh, it's it's very easy to do. It's very easy to forget that you are uh, that the the terms of use around the these models is often very loose. So um, at, uh, you, for yourself, but also for anybody you're working with, you want to be informing them of, of just what, uh, uh, what you need to be careful about, the risks that you run there. And so speaking of, of that, as we start to close here, I, and I, I wish we could go a lot longer still. <laughs> we knew this would happen. But, you know, what is on the horizon for AI? So we know about, you know, in terms of, privacy, security, a lot of times we don't have control over the information that's being put out there into the universe, the the the, the world wide web about us. Um, I, I just this morning, I was reading an article that a cousin, one of my cousins shared with me about a woman who went just went onto LinkedIn and decided to assume the identity of someone whose profile that she found. But I could imagine as cool as these technologies are and as useful as they can be, not just in uh, you know, our education system, but in, in driving different data decision or data backed decisions, but beyond that being able to help us operate our businesses more efficiently, there are always going to be people who are going to use it for nefarious reasons. I mean, there's there's no workaround around that. What do you think is on the horizon for AI? So in the spirit of continuous improvement, continuous innovation, what does, does Shell Carlson see on the immediate horizon for AI? Well, certainly that connection to action so that it's not just something which is analyzing something, but something which is enabling you to take action. 
So we hinted very briefly at the fact that uh, some of these services are offering plugins where you can then connect to third-party services. Now, they're still very limited. They're things like, well, you can connect to Expedia. And so maybe you can use generative AI to go in and find your flight tickets, plan a, a plan a um, uh, plan a vacation and, and do things like that. But that's kind of, at the end of the day, that's not what we're really excited about. The, the real excitement happens when we start connecting these things into, well, into my, my accounting system. Now, I would like to be able to automate more of those things. I can pull out insights from those or uh, having better connectivity into CRM solutions, into ERP solutions and, and things like that. So there is this bridging the um, the generation and insights to the the action gap that's happening and creating these virtual agents that or virtual assistants that we that we talked about before, whereby you know I don't have I can't hire a whole bunch of college students that I would like to go in and and find this information for me and go in and, and make sense of it. Now I can now I don't need to. Um, so that is absolutely uh, is absolutely happening, and that this explosion of of applications with generative AI components of it, you're going to see it even more. It's we've already seen it, starting to see it. We're going to see it even more. But what's what we should be talking about is that other aspect to it. But what about the downsides for this? And it is one where, in good news, these tools are, are are very powerful. Bad news, these these tools are very powerful. It does make it possible to create fake information, uh, to <laughs> imitate um, uh, somebody who sounds very, very like uh, a parent, uh, a child. Um, you, you are, if you haven't already seen much more sophisticated spam and phishing uh, attacks, you are going to be seeing them soon. We're already seeing instances where banks are being um uh, are, are being um they're, they're so far usually catching them but ai is being used to generate uh the the voice of of a long-term customer and so you know the the person on the bank side thinks that they are working with a with a client who they have uh authority to go and execute trades for and lo and behold the person on the other side is really a synthesized voice which is just too difficult to distinguish from the real one all of that's happening. Um, we shouldn't forget that obviously next year is an election year and we can expect plenty more deep fakes of uh, fraudulent images, fraudulent uh, statements, uh, you name it, uh, that 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 will almost certainly be coming. So we, um, there, there are without doubt worries and challenges on, on that front that we're going to, much in the same way that I think our parents' generation didn't really need to, to worry about phishing attacks in, in the same way or uh, the Nigerian um, prince scams and things <laughs> like that. We're going to have another generation of those far more sophisticated and we're going to be teaching our kids as to on uh, the, what are the what are the ways in which you can you can spot those. Yeah. Well, Shell, I know there's so much more that you can say about all of this. How can people connect with you to learn even more about you? and the work that you're doing? Well, please absolutely don't hesitate to reach out to, uh, out to me on LinkedIn. There are very few Shell Carlsons in the AI space out there generally. So um, don't hesitate to reach out to me directly. Uh, I'm also the host of the Data Science Leaders podcast. Uh, would uh, If you feel inspired to uh, to find out with, about the lives of of the, those miserable folks who are on the hook for going in and delivering outcomes with these things, please don't hesitate to tune into that. We also do have a host of resources on our uh, Domino Data Lab or domino.ai website. Uh, for example, I have a report coming out on low-hanging generative AI projects, and which goes in and talks a little bit more about those five uh, jobs to be done with generative AI. Um, but there is there is so much good good content that that's out there. I am really excited to be hearing the rest of your season, where I think you are going to be demystifying these things even more, and are going to be supplying even more practical guidance to uh, to folks that uh, um, that uh, uh, more than than I can go into, and the one that we can go into, I guess, in in this short uh, short time. But above all, I would say, do not fear getting started with these tools. They are 
sometimes it can be a limit, a little bit intimidating. Sometimes it can be easy to, uh, to, to get on them. Uh, you try out something, it didn't really impress you, you just put it aside. But resist that temptation. There is um, so much that you can do today with these tools to increase your productivity. You would really be missing out if you're not taking advantage of them. And with that, being said, thank you, Shell, so much. This has been a wonderful conversation. And please come back to the show. <laughs> My pleasure. Please, I'd be more than happy please. to. Thank you very much, Alicia. Alicia. Okay. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed watching this video. And we have even more great videos coming up for you. They'll include actual demonstrations of different AI tools that you can start using to improve the way your business operates. So make sure you subscribe to this channel and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss any of this information that's coming up. Thank you so much, and I'll see you in the next video.